This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Welcome back. Um, I'm Dr. Philip Joseph, and I'm a professional publisher of academic journals in the humanities. Um, I'm also a part time art historian, and in my free time as it is, I'm an enthusiast devourer of historical novels. Also, as a, a member of the Iron Charles Publications Committee, I'm delighted to see in the session, so far not too much blood on the carpet, uh, in this wonderful conference which is just a gender writer brought to a committee meeting of uh, the brainchild of um, Jane Winkers, and, um, which will soon have a virtual live, uh, thanks to the online expertise of Dr. Matt Pilper here in the front, who may have some scattering back the tapes as, uh, as, the, as the virtual conference begins to spur into life. So, to this afternoon's first session, um, we're going to concentrate on the differences and similarities between historical fiction and academic history. And of course, to some extent, um, the discussion will be an extension and the development of debates and the views that we've heard this morning, uh, and in last night's fascinating opening debate uh, between Hilary Mantel and Professor uh, David Lowe's. However, the best history, whether fiction or academic, uh, and or academic fact, relies on the accretion of ideas, of multiple voices, um, of multiple audiences, all of which help the subject to evolve, to develop, to come into life in the mind's eye of the reader. Indeed, the best authors, whether historians or novelists, will undertake their, their readers on a journey of ideas. And it's what the late great socialist historian Ralph Samuel called a two-way relationship between the reader and the writer, in which the printed pages create a collaboration and an understanding between them. And to help us do that this afternoon, it gives me great pleasure to introduce four speakers who, in different ways, write in multiple, uh, with multiple uh, voices as authors, who may or may not adapt their authorial voice uh, to suit their different audiences. But that's not for me to say, that's for them to tell us. Um, <laughs> and with this morning's session, uh, each speaker will talk for a maximum of 15 minutes, uh, in which they'll set out their score. Um, and if they go over, I can wait this is wet ball. Okay. <laughs> if they go over, that's great. Right. Uh, and then, uh, then perhaps there may be a brief discussion between the speakers, which may interest you. And then I'll open up the uh, open up the floor to questions. And in fact, I think we've now got a mic so that uh, Matt will run round uh, to the person uh, who's asking the questions, where everyone can hear. Um, so to our first speaker, Maria, Maria Marigolinis, uh, Mark, Mark, Margaret, Margaret, <laughs> thank you. And Maria is uh, very widely published, uh, on a broad range of topics and different types of publication. As a journalist and uh, as a critic, she's perhaps best known in this country uh, as the London correspondent for the Nation, and in fact, where she has written quite recently, uh, perceptively and movingly um, on all, all manner of topics, most recently some excellent pieces on, on the plight of Greece, but picking up on something that Elizabeth Chadwick said this morning about, um, you know, she's also picking up on the people, on the human experience, and, and I think that's, that's, that's very important. And Maria has also written for The Guardian, the TLS, the London Review of Books, and in the highly respected uh, academic publication, History Workshop Journal. And I think given her intellectual range and personal writing experience, it's little wonder then that Maria is also highly praised, uh, according to the REA, um, <laughs> 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 yeah, highly praised writing to undergraduate students uh, in the Department of History, Classics uh, and Archaeology at Birkbeck here at the University of London. And in fact, it's in a recent academic article in History Workshop Journal that Maria raised some important questions concerning the responsibility that the author bears to historical evidence. For example, what authority do they, as authors, um, have to write about the recent past, recent past when perhaps they have no personal direct knowledge of that? Um, 
of those sometimes awful events, which may even be arguably unspeakable. And what about modernism's recognition that all experience is subjective, uh, and that every narrative is a partial one? So all of these are important points, uh, which have, I think, considerable cogency for this afternoon's discussion. So, Maria, over to you. Thank you very much for really making me sound awfully grand. <laughs> um, so, as Luca says, I, I'm not a historian, but because I teach writing in the history department at Berkeley, I've had to learn the rules um, for doing history. Um, I'm a journalist, and also, like probably everyone else in this room, I'm trying to finish a novel. And I'm going to begin, though, by talking about a project I'm involved with now, because it's really made me think about history and narrative in a slightly different way. When we're feeling particularly grandiose, journalists like to think we're writing the history of the present. Go out, you report your story, you collect your facts, you listen to the voices you read, and then you try to come up with some sort of sensible interpretation of what you've learned in linear form of a magazine or newspaper, sort of instant history. But at the moment, for the first time, I'm working on a radio documentary um, about the crisis in Greece, um, which involves cutting hours and hours of interviews down to just a few short minutes. Um, and I'm understanding more vividly than ever before what happens when you strip mine experience for meanings. If you record someone talking for an hour or two hours, and the sounds around them, and then you have to compress the conversation to fit into a 40-minute documentary, you lose all those evasions and hesitations and the way people circle around what they want to say or change the subject to avoid something painful or slip from a personal story <coughs> into a political rant to reclaim some feeling of power or dignity. And it's that infinitely expressive second-to-minute-to-minute -minute slippage of conversation and consciousness which is the texture of thought and emotion and experience. And that's what fiction depends on and has to invent. And what academic history mostly, but not always, because I think there's sometimes a tendency to simplify what history is and what history can do, um, finds it quite difficult to capture. So I have a, a, a quote here from Marguerite Yusinar, um, <coughs> when she was writing her novel, The Memoirs of Hadrian, was especially concerned about this problem of the voice and the lack of evidence for how people spoke to each other in the past. She was trying to find a way to write Hadrian's voice. Uh, and she said, neither antiquity nor any of the intervening centuries offers us the equivalent of a conversation between Pierre Bezukhov and Prince Andre and Tolstoy. We have very little to go on, bits of voice out of which to reconstruct an entire tone or timbre of voice, the way others reconstitute a broken statue out of fragments of marble. But if the language of our characters is so important, that is because it expresses or betrays them completely. Now, lots of historical novelists have written about this problem of language. There was a, a Sarah Waters, when she finished uh, The Night Watch, which is book I really love, wrote a very interesting piece in The Guardian about how she found the language for that book by reading diaries and so on from the 1940s. Um, Henry James refused to write historical fiction because he said it depends on recreating the consciousness of people, lots of people who did it long ago, and something we can't even do for now. But um, it is in that language that I think fiction, that, that play with language and metaphor, that fiction departs from what more linear, the more linear discourse of academic history can do. But what is the status of those kinds of inventions? Are they, do they actually tell us anything uh, about the past, or are they just illusions and chimeras? Um, History and fiction are both simplifications or maps. They're not opposites. Uh, I think you could say we could say that they exist on a kind of continuum. They have different core responsibilities, which neither one can violate. And I think most people would agree that the core responsibility of history, in the end, beyond any postmodern you know, epistemological doubt, um, is bound to empiricism and has an absolute responsibility to facts. It matters what exactly was in the Attorney General's advice to Tony Blair about the legality of the Iraq war. It matters how many people actually died in the Holocaust. These things are facts, and we can find them out. We have to. <clears throat> but, or and, as we all now know, the selection and framing and arranging of those facts uh, is always conditioned by where the historian herself stands, in space, <clears throat> in time, and also intellectually or ideologically. Um, and uh, here I always come back to that wonderful old chestnut by Walter Benjamin, which I think puts it better than anything else. 
uh, who wrote, the past can be seized only as an image which flashes up at the instant when it can be recognized and is never seen again. I think what he meant by that is, we can only see what we can see from here. Uh, we can only see what our preconceptions and our own intellectual frameworks and ways of thinking allow us to see from the past. But he goes on to say, to articulate the past historically does not mean to recognize it the way it really was. It means to seize hold of the memory as it flashes up at a moment of danger. <coughs> in every era, the attempt must be made in to wrest tradition away from a conformism that's about to overpower it. <coughs> in other words, our view of the past goes dead on us and becomes inert and becomes another part of the forces that go to just keeping things as they are. And uh, this relates very much to what Tracy was saying this morning, actually, in a very interesting talk about regeneration and how, in fact, that does complicate the past for us and our, our view of the past. <coughs> and I think that the responsibility of serious historical fiction, which is perhaps more difficult to define than the responsibility of history, uh, begins there. Um, I think because it's by definition an imaginative encounter between now and then, fiction makes the distance between us and the past visible. And it reveals it as something contingent and malleable, something that's open to debate and change and isn't fixed. Um, so that the distance and the relationship between us and them, or now and us and them, or now and them, is in a sense its subject. Um, and if it goes deep enough, it can change the way we understand and assimilate the past, and therefore also the way we understand the present. And of course, the best academic history does this too, very often. But because fiction works through empathy and metaphor and emotional engagement, it can bring those past experiences up close against the way we think and feel things now and alter those set pieces that play almost unconsciously in our minds. And to come back to um, The Night Watch, I think that book, for me, feminized the blitz um, and complicated the national mythology we have about it. Um, perhaps my all-time favorite historical novel, Toni Morrison's uh, ghost story, Beloved, not only enters into the experience of slavery uh, in America, but also reveals and reframes the way in which it haunts American history. Um, she wrote about that book, I know I can't change the future, but I can always change the past. It is the past, not the future, which is infinite. I think what she meant by that is not that she was making up facts, but she was changing our relationship to what had come before and reclaiming it and subverting it, if you like, for the present. Um, and of course, there are all sorts of thorny questions that then come up about how much and what kinds of things a writer of historical fiction is allowed to change or to make up, about what kind of responsibility one has to the people who live the experiences one's appropriating, about what kind of contract one has with the reader, what does the reader think you're doing, does the reader, what does the reader think is true, um, and also about what's meant by that word that people have used quite a lot this morning, which I think is a very complicated word and something you might want to talk about, which is authenticity. What is that? What is authenticity? What do you mean by it? So the thought really that I wanted to just uh, put on the table here is, is that idea that we don't have to be a relativist to think that serious historical fiction uh, can contribute something to our understanding of history. Um, it's, and what it contributes above all is that it makes explicit and calls into question our relationship to the past. introducing our next speaker as Dr. Dr. Mortimer, um, <laughs> because uh, unlike some of us who just have with one doctor, uh, he's actually got two, and he's having recently been awarded uh, a DLIT by examination at the University of Exeter. And he also publishes under two different names, his academic works as Ian Mortimer, and his novels using his two middle names, James Forrester. And uh, as the academic, Ian Mortimer, he's most recently given us uh, Medieval Intrigue, Decoding um, Royal Conspiracies, um, which was published late last year by Continuum, was it? Yes. Yes, I mean, it's September it's last year, right. that's right. Uh, he also um, wrote about uh, Henry V's glorious year, 1415, uh, extension, I suppose, was rather 
less glorious for Charles VI when he's poor over on it and feels the back and forth. But um, uh, Ian has also given us a fascinating and best-selling Time Traveller's Guide to Medieval England, um, about which Catherine Hughes said in the garden, in the, in the garden, in the garden, no. Guardian, she may have been in the garden at the time, but anyway, she, she said in the Guardian, Ian Mortimer doesn't hold uh, with any fancy notion about the past being impossible to know. He brings us Monty Python and the Holy Grail with footnotes, and my goodness, it's fun. <laughs> uh, moreover, writing is James Forrester. He's delighted with such novels as uh, Sacred Treason and Roots of Betrayal. And it's through these work that he uh, has himself dis uh, has described himself as a poet expressing himself through historical fiction and over time redefining the meaning of what it means to be a historian. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mortimer. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start off with a couple of quotes about history. My brother's a fireman. And you get to know if you're a fireman, other firemen quite well. And one of these fellow firemen said to him once, I'm a historian too. I know all about the Peninsula War. I read all the sharp novels. <laughs> which I thought was one instance of, uh, which is quite interesting about what people think a historian is. And uh, another really comes to mind was a symposium that was funded by the Wellcome Trust, about 20 people there, uh, and this is about um, seven years ago. And in the course of the debate, one of the, the, the academics said, uh, medical history has got nothing to do with the past. Medical history is what we teach. It's not about the past. Which if you think about it, is a very interesting comment. There was one hell of a debate after that, which was not in the final published volume, unfortunately. <laughs> You'd be very amused by it, some of the things that were said in the course of that debate, because she was not alone in, uh, in uh, maintaining it. And just before coming in here, somebody mentioned, oh, but there's historical fiction, historical fiction, isn't there? Well, I would say there's history and history and, and history and then some more. Um, because quite unlike uh, uh, what uh, Catherine Hughes says there, no, I think the past is very, very difficult to know. And um, Time Traveller's Guide was written in a certain way to put a certain uh, message across and to demonstrate you can do history in different ways. Um, and also to pose questions which perhaps have not been asked, which will only answer, because the sort of questions there don't really fall in line with uh, the way that most academics work, which is to find the evidence and then explore that for what it says. Uh, about the past in relation to what we previously put in you. But if I can go through uh, sort of a, a range of areas, and that I think, I mean, to start off at the, the, the scholarly end, and I wouldn't confuse scholarship with academia here. I think academics are largely paid from the public purse to do a certain job, and therefore academia is quite constrained. It's very constrained in the way it writes. It's, uh, aiming for neutrality, or the myth of obje objective neutrality, objective uh, views of the past, there are certain forms of evidence which are allowed, certain forms which aren't. Ultimately, the whole academic establishment is about teaching people and making them think and see and training them, um, and most academics are actually paid to teach and to, 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 to pass on certain skills, and analyzing the evidence. But that's not the same as scholarship, because scholarship can exist quite apart from academia, and it can exist within academia, and it can really tackle this question of facts. And we mentioned facts, but academics have to battle, and scholars have to battle with what is a fact. Is the fact that there was a second die on the 21st of September 1327? I spent a very long time saying that it's not a fact. And so far, uh, despite it um, uh, appearing in English Historical Review in 2005, the consensus of academics is that no, it is a fact, and I am wrong because no one agrees with me, not that my argument is flawed. My argument is that we can show that the death <clears throat> was reported by Lord Barclay on the 21st of September, and the news was re 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 received by Edward III on the 23rd of September in the night, uh, at least 130 miles away, it was uh, at Lincoln at the time, um, and he immediately announced it. So we can prove that there was no checking the evidence before it was announced, and we can then start to deconstruct how people know what we know, what they, what we think we know. It's there in the evidence, but is the evidence necessarily correct? So at that level, scholars will tackle very specific questions of what is a fact. Uh, and that's not necessarily what you're doing <coughs> as an academic. And in line with that medical history quote, that medical historian was teaching the syllabus, 
and was not a scholar in the sense of reinvestigating what facts are. <clears throat> to my mind, academia doesn't offer that many opportunities to the historian to do history, because it can do it offers the opportunity to do academic history. If you want to write in more challenging ways, more um, self-examining ways, you've got to move away from academia and start to change your form. I find it extraordinary, utterly extraordinary, we have 3,500 professional teachers of history in this uh, 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 higher education level in this country, and we don't actually teach people about how to write. We have all these people teaching about uh, um, uh, assimilating knowledge, uh, 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 assessing evidence, but no one actually teaches historical form. And um, historical form does develop. You can have badly written history, you can have well written history, you can have challenging new forms. And in fact, time travel guide is interesting because it, that idea, what if you really could go to the past, what will you see, what will you read, what will you, etc., um, that raised a lot of questions I couldn't find the answers to very easily in the books I was consulting when I started off with that idea. It took 13 years to, to, to research and write that, and I read four books in the intervening period. And it's from direct experience of handling over the fourth uh, household accounts that I got some of the answers to these questions that were in the back of my mind. But the form, the important point is the form was asking questions that previously hadn't been asked. What do people brush their teeth with in the Middle Ages if they do brush their teeth, or what do they wipe their bottom with, etc. There, uh, there is evidence that you can answer those questions. Whether it's true for everybody or not is a different matter. But there are ways of using form to challenge orthodox opinions. Another example was the 1415 book you, you mentioned, where in 1415 I decided I was going to try and take everything, comprehensively everything we could find out about Henry V for one year, <coughs> and arrange it on the page according to the date at which it happened, or as near to it if we're not absolutely certain. Because I wanted to get away from the idea of a historian taking evidence and arranging it to suit his argument, which I think is a, a weakness of uh, uh, the way the historians operate if they're being responsible and, uh, and trying to represent the past as it really was. So what do we get if we uh, put Henry V, that page, everything day by day down the page? But well, we notice there are no women in this story. Now that's not just because there are no sources touching upon women, but he excludes women from the, the royal household. He, uh, he mentions two women of the 44 names in his will. And when he rewrites the, the, the ordinances to go to France, he has that strange one at the end, um, where if a woman is found with the English army, um, she's to be warned, and the second time she's to be taken before the constable or marshal of the army and have her left arm broken. Uh, there's a cruel misogyny underneath this man, which only becomes apparent when you start looking at the totality of what we know. It's the things that aren't there that become apparent. So using form, you can, you can start to question quite a lot of our uh, accepted wisdom uh, about the past. Moving towards the fiction end of things, um, I, I disagree probably with everybody who's spoken about authenticity so far, because I, I really, you probably can sense this, but I use a different name for fiction. As Ian Morton, I have to stand up and fight for years, if necessary, that I've, why I've said what I've said. And if I'm wrong, I'll admit it, and if I'm not, I'll carry on fighting. We, as James Forrester, my middle name's, uh, I let my hair down in the manner of speaking. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's playtime. I am not responsible for anything I say, so I make things up, I lie, uh, uh, I change names. Um, that every event probably never happened. Every event mentioned in my book has probably never happened. Um, most of the things I refer to, I have probably twisted outrageously. In fact, I know I have twisted them outrageously. I mean, uh, but they're not really about the past. Um, they're not trying to do what, they're not trying to do badly what I do, hopefully, as well as I can, uh, as a mortem, as a historian. I, um, to take the example of the first book, Sacred Treason, uh, uh, that, the inspiration for that was a very beautiful psychology lecturer who decided she'd like to have an affair with me. And this put me in a rather difficult place to marry and with children. And, uh, it was a very intense experience. And you question what is loyalty and betrayal and the importance of those. And it's very difficult to get across to people this day and age. You know, what's the big deal, somebody might say? Uh, 
In fact, quite a few people did say that. Um, if you transfer that to the 16th century, 1563, and uh, the, the, the doubts there are in someone's mind, betrayal and loyalty are big things. Loyalty to the state, loyalty to your religion. I mean, it's fascinating how we went from such a Catholic country to such a Protestant one so quickly. Uh, in the mid-1560s, uh, over it's about half the JPs in this country are refusing to swear the oath of uh, loyalty to Queen Elizabeth. And yet, by the 1590s, we are happily persecuting Catholics left, right, and centre. Loyalty, betrayal. You can use the past as a magnifying glass and really look at some of these emotions and heighten our sensitivity to them. So I, I have no truck with uh, the idea of events and authenticity to events. Um, I use the historical fiction to, to explore the, these different emotions. Loyalty to one's spouse obviously comes into it in a, in a, a very religious age. Um, <clears throat> so I was also going to say being in that historical fiction. Uh, so yes, in, between these things, I, I, I therefore tend to think there is this fundamental split between the two. That, uh, historians have to be ultimately responsible for what they write. In historical fiction, you can get away with murder. Um, having said that, there is a sort of authenticity in the fiction in that uh, I've a PhD in the period, and why misrepresent the period if I am since something in 1563? So if my main man goes into a, 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 an alehouse or a tavern and there is meat being cooked in advent, well, that's incorrect because you, you weren't allowed one. People didn't on the whole. Um, there were still restrictions on what you could eat and times you could eat uh, 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 and left over from the old religion. Um, likewise, you can work out when it was full tide, uh, tide was high and when the uh, uh, moon was full for these dates. So get that correct and get the dress correct. And actually, there is a degree of authenticity underpinning the way people look and the way people behave, as far as I, I, I can get it. Having now written the time travel guide to Elizabethan England, I realise how many mistakes I've made. So apologies to everybody who's read the and the roots of the trail and realise there's lots of mistakes that there are. Um, <clears throat> uh, on this one, uh, uh, I forgot now. I said this. I forgot what I was going to say. Um, <clears throat> how far do I give for time? I was about to say, it's like you. Can you remember it and you can remember it within two minutes? Yeah. Right. Um, no, I can't. <laughs> well, <our> next speaker. <laughs> well, I mean, you've got the message of what I was saying, and I'm looking for some questions, and they're telling me I'm wrong. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. not only studied vast topics such as 17th century intellectual history, but he's also written extensively um, on the purpose or purposes of history with such publications as Why Bother With History and What Is History For? And most recently, um, but he's concentrated on the intersections between genres, on the meeting points between history and fiction. And it's 2000, uh, with his 2009 book, History Meets Fiction, which was described by one reviewer, Keith Jenkins, as a brilliantly illuminating and provocatively engaged study of those massively porous borderlands between history fiction and fiction history. Dr. Southgate has also looked increasingly uh, interestingly at those dry as dust literary representations of historians in fiction. There's often distressing descriptions of individuals um, who endlessly pick over the desiccated remains and bones of the past and who seem utterly devoid of human emotion and feeling. Um, so who better to discuss, uh, continue our discussions on the differences and similarities between historical fiction and historical uh, and academic history. Thank you very much. <coughs> and I'm assuming I have ends two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought um, the best way I could approach this was by looking at three subjects in three sections. First, history as traditionally distinct from fiction. Second, the possible erosion of that distinction. And thirdly, I think the rather important question of whether if there is that erosion matters 
So first then, on the traditional distinction. I heard Simon Sharma some time ago describing historians as party poopers, <laughs> as avoiding people's fun. Actually, um, Alison Weir said something similar this morning, didn't she? Spoiling people's fun by replacing their enjoyable myths, fictions, with something rather more serious, the truth. And even sound a bit remorseful or apologetic about <laughs> spoiling their fun. <coughs> Similarly, Greg Denning, who was far from being a conservative practitioner, described himself as being a storyteller, but as an historian, a teller of true stories. I do not, he insisted, write fiction. <laughs> Those examples of historians continuing aspirations to tell the truth, and so to distinguish their own practice from fiction, could readily be multiplied, as we all know, from Thucydides in the 5th century BC, who wanted to be differentiated from his predecessors, such as the romantic uh, historical fiction writer Homer, right up to Arthur Marwick in the 21st century, for whom, I quote, a work of history differs totally from a novel, inasmuch as historians, unlike writers of fiction, make special efforts to separate out unambiguously what is securely established from what is basically speculation. Marwick there identifies what it takes to be the essential differences between historians and writers of fiction, that it is only the former whose work is evidentially based or securely established by empirical means. In that sense, history is scientific as not just speculation like fiction, but truthful, telling the story of the past, not just any other way, but demonstrably in conformity with what had actually happened. As Jeffrey Elton had claimed, the proper use of primary evidence, quote, should make possible a history that is indisputably true, not the historian's or novelist's invention. And that model of a, a history aspiring to, and sometimes even attaining truth, is one that still seems to be widely accepted, and indeed expected by the wider public. So they're presumably not surprised to read in a newspaper review of how one historian, quote, has managed to capture the essence of the Second World War in a compelling single volume. Think of that. <laughs> Such works that are claimed to be definitive, by which I take to mean that they effectively provide the last word on the subject, seem to appear quite regularly. <laughs> Trailed by a second division of near definitive, an adjective I saw ascribed to our work of the Great War very recently. So it was no doubt for good reason that one American historian entitled his autobiography The Pursuit of Truth. The pursuit of truth is what history is about, and that is what differentiates it, or so it is claimed, from fiction. History, in fact, is defined precisely by its not being fiction. Which brings me to my second section on the erosion of that, perhaps. Somehow things are not quite as unambiguous as Arthur Marwick proclaimed. Bipolarities have long gone out of fashion, boundaries replaced by borderlands, which is to say that the distinction between history and fiction has become increasingly eroded, or rather that there has been increasing recognition of the similarity of the two, if not the identity of the two. Identity is what is claimed by Hayden White. All the stories, he writes, and the duration itself has, be sh has been shown to be inherently fiction, whatever its subject matter. Even if we accept the problematic concept of facts that Ian was talking about just now, those supposedly unadorned blocks have to be used for a building. They have to be somehow welded or cemented or cobbled together in a form of a story or narrative that endows them with some significance and meaning. And to use them for that purpose involves us in looking at them in a specific way rather than any other way, from a specific perspective rather than from any other, of which there are, of course, innumerable possibilities, and in plotting them in a certain form. Another point that coincides, I think, at the end, for which there are, again, a number of competing alternatives. 
tragic comic ironic or whatever. And in one particular style, stylistic possibilities again being numerous, though limited by the cultural forms currently available to us. Narrative itself, then, is not a neutral medium in which events could be transparently represented. It incorporates an attempt to provide an explanation of what has happened, and that must be an interpretation. Whatever literary genre we are concerned with, whether history or fiction. Such stories, whether told by novelists or historians, are to be assessed by reference not to their truth or falsity, their correspondence or not with the supposed past, but to their coherence, consistency, intelligibility, and persuasiveness. Now, Hayden White has been arguing along such lines for quite some time. His letter history was published in 1973. So it's hardly surprising that historians themselves, or some of them, have come to recognize just how precarious their position in relation to the fact fictive balance has become. And that precariousness becomes the more obvious as historians quite properly, in my view, seek to extend the range of their own operations to include territory that has been previously excluded from them as professionally off limits. That territory might include, for example, the emotions or other aspects of human life that are not susceptible to empirical study. In such situations, John Demos has suggested that they might indicate that extension of their empire into what were previously alien parts by using different typefaces. <laughs> those, could <be> used <laughs> those could be used to indicate when they enter areas of which they may claim to have knowledge, but for which they lack what he calls full proof. The point of that is to enable both historians and their readers to retain a clear distinction between fact and fiction. Now that exemplifies the tensions within the historical profession itself. And those tensions can only be exacerbated by the numerous hybrids, by which I mean deliberate blendings, deliberate blendings of what's known as fact and fiction, that have become of late so popular as forms of entertainment. I mean, fact based films, fact based fiction, novelized biographies, fictional historical memoirs, imaginative or fictional representations of real people. And some authors go to the lengths of using fictional photographs to add a spurious pair of historical authenticity. <laughs> and I must say, had not, um, had not Justin got in first, I was going to mention, of course, the case of the real work of a fictional artist. Just so we are all aware, we are all well enough aware of how examples of these hybrids could readily be multiplied in a culture where entertainment consists in ever larger part, it seems, of negotiating what F.H. Bradley in 1874 described as a labyrinth of truth and tangled falsehood. And at this point, I think an ethical question arises for me. So for my third section, of does, he, does the erosion between the two actually matter? And if you read my book, which I hope you all, <laughs> all will, you will see that I actually agonized over this for some time while writing it and confessed to a sort of surprising myself, I suppose you could say. Uh, because my, my answer to the question is yes, paradoxically, it may be inconsistently, I don't know. The distinction does seem to me to matter. I, I, I don't have time here to share with you, as I may say, my own ecmanic moment in any detail. But suffice it to say that it came as a result of reading Daniel Mendelssohn's The Lost, A Search for Six of Six Million. This is an account of the author's attempt to find out how six of his relatives died in 1941. So it is an account of historical research written by someone who is particularly aware of historiography, of how history is researched and constructed, of how memories can get distorted, of how moral and aesthetic judgments intrude. In short, Mendelssohn set himself the task of finding out what happened to six people as representatives of the six million Jews 
Holocaust, of whom all he knew, this was the story that had come down through the family, all he knew was that they had been killed by the Nazis. And that pitiful inadequacy of, of, of that account was what he was reacting against. He wanted, he said, to write the story of people who had no story anymore and restore to them their particularity and distinctiveness. And presumably, he could have sat at his desk and written an imaginative reconstruction of their ends, and that would have amounted to historical fiction. Sort of armchair activity, you might say. I read the other day on this uh, 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 journalist recording how he once interviewed Beryl Bainbridge about her novel, historical novel, about Captain Scott and his trip to the South Pole. Had she ever been anywhere near the Antarctic herself, he asked her. She looked at me <coughs> as if I was mad and gave a shiver. Certainly not, it's far too cold. <laughs> now this is not the attitude that uh, Daniel Mendelhall took. Instead he went round the world examining evidence in situ, interviewing relatives, friends, acquaintances, and finally constructing a story that resembled at least something of what had actually happened to them. Now, admittedly, that amplified story is constructive, subjective, partial, fictive. And possibly with some of the characteristics of any story he might have made up sitting at home in his armchair to produce historical fiction. But the distinction between the entirely imaginary and the empirically researched does, it seems to me, need to be maintained. And I say that for what I suppose are ultimately ethical reasons. First, in relation to the reader, and this is something that came out, I think, this morning, or was it yesterday, with Hilary Mantel, there's a question of trust. What do we feel about a dealer in oriental ceramics who sells us a Ming Dynasty vase that turns out to have been produced in the back streets of Hong Kong a few weeks ago? We may not ourselves be expert enough to perceive the difference. Any more, perhaps, than we can perceive the difference in authenticity between Primo Levi's memoirs, his experience of prisoner Auschwitz, and Benjamin Wilkomerski, do you remember he wrote his pseudo-memoirs? Very moving, they were thought to be until they were discovered famous. But if we're taken in, as we were in the latter case, we feel deceived and we lose our trust for the future. Second, the victims. They are not present to make demands on us, but maybe we need for our own sakes to provide them with a story that is not just made up by us to suit our own convenience, but that gets as close to their experience as we can manage. And third, the perpetrators, and this I think may be the clincher, the perpetrators had done everything possible to have that story and those people erased from the record, to make it appear that their crimes and their victims never ever existed. I think there are parallels here with slavery as well. And on this occasion, the powerful, the then winners, and would-be mythologizers did not write the history or have the last word. So briefly to conclude, first then, there has traditionally been a clear distinction between history and fiction. Second, that distinction has been eroded to the extent that it has become clear that history themselves are fictive, <coughs> but further, it is nonetheless desirable that some distinction be retained. And if that sounds contradictory, so be it. <laughs> there may be no theoretical justification for maintaining that distinction, inasmuch as both histories and historical fictions are intended to represent what happened in the past, and the narratives of both are fictive. But there are, I think, ethical imperatives, history has its own procedures, maybe its own truth, and so do description. So perhaps, instead of spoiling anyone's fun, we should recognise each other's distinctive and maybe complementary contributions and party together. <laughs>
session is Professor Rebecca Stolt, um, who would be simply qualified, I think, to speak at this conference for about historical fact, uh, fiction and scientific fact. Um, Rebecca has written a well-received biography of Charles Darwin, uh, Darwin in the Barnacle, uh, as well as a book on the cultural history of the oyster. She's also a freelance writer and broadcaster, and if that weren't enough, um, she's also a professor of English literature and creative writing at the celebrated course uh, at the University of East Anglia. And for those Radio 4 listeners amongst us, many of you will have heard um, the Book of Red Time adaptation of uh, Rebecca Scott's novel, The Coral Thief, which brought to life the, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the intrigues of early 19th century Paris. And as Rebecca herself has said, history is at its best when you can immerse yourself in it. Uh, so I'll find speak, <coughs> Rebecca. I'm conscious that there are so many rabbits running in the room now that my fellow speakers have set off. So um, <laughs> I'll talk quite briefly so we can attend to the rabbits, which I'm sure everyone's got lots of uh, questions <laughs> and statements to make. Um, when I first uh, started out as an academic, I, I was an academic for a long time, I still am, but um, when I first gave my uh, PhD paper, my first conference paper, at a conference about this size when I was in my early 20s, a woman came up to me afterwards and handed me her card and said she was a literary agent and said, did I write fiction? And I said, I didn't, looking a bit puzzled. And she said, very confidently, you will. <laughs> um, and I think what she meant by that was not that I had written a very elegant paper or anything, but it was rather pretentious and pulling towards fiction, even at that point. Um, and indeed, I did eventually start to write fiction. She had to wait rather a long time for me to, she did sign me at that point, but I um, uh, took her, took a rather long time to make her any money, uh, mainly because I carried on writing academic books um, through my 20s and 30s. Um, and I want to talk a little bit just for a few minutes about uh, writing, about being on that spectrum, of being someone who writes fiction and non-fiction, uh, who writes academic books, or used to write academic books, and now experiments on that spectrum. I mean, that's, I do totally agree with um, our various people who have articulated the ways in which uh, it, it is a spectrum, not, these things are not opposites, uh, or at least from my point of view, they're not. Um, and uh, in 2004, when I had finished writing my book on Darwin, which was a sort of experiment with partial biography, I was interested in writing about um, the eight years of Darwin's life when he uh, dissected barnacles and was trying to work out the kind of puzzle of the barnacle, how it had come to be. And uh, I, I wrote this little book based on the archives uh, about, you know, from Wrote, wrote that book out of his letters and uh, his accounts and his journals and so on. So I've been in the archive for a long time, digging the story out, but also trying to write, it was a book for favour, and so I was trying to write uh, a book which my publishers kept insisting would be read on trains. You know, so think about suspense, think about character, think about place, think about the pleasure of your reader as well as carving out, quarrying out this story which had been rather overlooked by historians before. So it had been a very interesting two years in which I had been, as it were, really closely attending to the archives, but also thinking in terms of uh, turning this into, into a book that would be read by a much, much wider audience than I had been used to before. It was not a work of historical fiction, but it was already pushing at the borders, it was already pushing at, uh, at form. And I suddenly found myself awake and excited by the project in a way that I hadn't been to, to that degree for some time before. The experiment, the, the playing around with this project that I'd been given, this set of um, new tools, as it were, was one of the most exciting things that had happened to me for a long time. Soon after that, as that book started to make its way into, in the world, and as I was holding my breath thinking, did I get away with it? Because there were passages in it in which I speculated very audaciously about what Darwin might have, you know, for instance, I knew from a letter that Darwin was uh, thinking about a particular set of questions on a particular day. I also knew from you know, loads and loads of uh, uh, records that had been left that on that particular day his boy was sick and that he and the gardener went and cropped the pear trees in the orchard. So putting all of that together, 
I experimented with little scenes written in the present tense in which I had Darwin think through a set of scientific problems as he walked in the orchard amongst the pear trees, overseeing the garden and doing, you know, so I could bring uh, the, the, uh, the set of problems and ideas I knew he was thinking about on that particular day into a time and place and a moment um, and dramatise it to a certain extent. Um, so I've been uh, experimenting with that and trying to stay as close to the archival material as I could and at the same time trying to bring it to life, trying to think about smell and place and putting Darwin's feet on the ground rather than have him just somehow as this disembodied series of ideas. Um, and soon after uh, I, that book was making its way in the world and as I say the reviews were coming in and I was going around talking about it and so on. Um, I was on a train early one morning and I found myself scribbling in my notebook uh, the question, I think it was articulated like this, something like, what happens when a historian comes to the end of the archives? And then quick, quite quickly a follow-on question, what happens when she knows something to be true but can't prove that it is? Um, and then the third question, which was a bit more philosophically complex, which followed quite quickly on that, what about the kind of truth that lies beyond the footnotable fact? Question mark. And out of those three questions, which were all slightly different articulations of the same sort of questions, um, I began to think about that, that sort of in my head, the idea of reaching the end of what's knowable, what's footnotable, what's in the archives, and yet having a really strong sense from a body of knowledge behind you that something happened that you couldn't actually prove to be true. And I began to carve out a very, uh, still looks to me rather odd book, but one that uh, I learned an enormous amount from, uh, my first historical novel called Ghost Walk, uh, which was precisely about that set of questions. What, it's about a historian who was working on Newton, Isaac Newton, and who had um, come to the end of the archives and yet had a really strong hunch that something had happened between between uh, Newton and some of his uh, colleagues, scientific colleagues, uh, in alchemy in Trinity College in 1665. And the novel sort of came out of that. Now, I suppose what I would try to articulate there is that the book was not about trying to write the definitive truth about Isaac Newton, alchemy, Trinity College, 1665, but was actually about trying to explore that set of questions about the relationship between the known and the unknown, about what is knowable and how we know. Um, and I, I think that's probably important to say it, um, or to remind us all that historians, or sorry, novelists who write uh, historical fiction aren't necessarily sitting down, sitting down in order to write an accurate record. They're reaching for something that's beyond what's footnotable, as well as the footnotes. It's, it's those two things that often are in, in tension. Um, and which produce uh, the desire that, that, that fuels the writing. Uh, one more example, uh, uh, Ghost Walk uh, was finished in 2007, and, and uh, soon afterwards I returned to the book which I've been writing for about a decade now, which I have just finished. Um, I have the, the um, proofs on my desk at home, um, which was a, a long, long book in which I've been trying to write uh, the history of the evolutionists before Darwin, those men and women who um, had had evolutionary ideas of various glimmering kinds in the 2,000 years before Darwin. And people had written that history, but they'd written it in an incredibly specialised, very narrow way, uh, mostly in ways that were not at all interested in the people and the moments and the places in which these ideas had happened. So the project which I've just finished, 10 years in the making, has been an attempt to, to try to bring the people back into that history and to try um, to explain why those ideas happened in particular moments, in particular places. But the really frustrating thing for me in writing over those last 10 years has been that there are no women in that history who published evolutionary ideas before Darwin. And no matter how hard I looked and no matter how hard I dug, there were women in the story everywhere, but none of them had actually published um, or even written down you know, notes about evolutionary ideas in ways that would justify me being able to use them. So I stopped about five years into this long project 
I began to be very frustrated again by the absence of women in this history. And I found myself sitting daydreaming in the library and thinking, where would such a woman come from if she were to have been there? Um, where, what part of history would she have come from? How, where would she have emerged in this 2,000 year story that I've just put together? And the answer was for me, in thinking about it, in that thought experiment, she would have come probably from Paris uh, around about 1810, 1815, something like that. She probably would have come through um, uh, having studied with Lamarck in some way. Um, she would have lived through the French Revolution. She would probably, she might possibly have cross-dressed in order to be able to move between different gendered spaces. Um, and so on. I just started, you know, she, as it were, this figure, ghost, if you like, began to appear out of this mass of material. And as I began to think about her, I became less and less um, compelled by the history book that I was writing and became more and more compelled to try to write about her. And The Coral Thief, which was my last novel, which was a uh, serialised on uh, BBC Radio 4, uh, was her story. It was an attempt uh, to put her into history, as it were, to think about where she might have come from, what the world would look like for her, what she would have read, how she might have thought, uh, what kinds of conversations might have been possible to her, and so on. Uh, and so that, that book came out of that set of problems, as it were, for me, uh, as a uh, feminist historian. Uh, so in some way, then, I have moved backwards and forwards on this spectrum between fiction and non-fiction, um, in order to, uh, to find certain things out. There are certain things that were more available to me in writing fiction than they were in writing uh, more straightforward history. But also, I've moved backwards and forwards on the spectrum in order to experiment with form. It's going back to what Ian was saying. You know, that, that there is an enormous, um, you know, I just want to make a, a big plea for experiment and risk-taking here. Uh, that it isn't just about staying safe and playing with what's already known, but about reaching for something that's unsettling. And for me, one of the best experiences in moving out of um, uh, a life in which I, I wrote academic books and into this world in which I move between fiction and non-fiction is that, that what is knowable has become more and more unsettling for me in doing that. And I think that's a good thing, or it, at least it has been in terms of um, how I value my own writing. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I just want to finish with um, a nod to Sebald, who is one of my favourite writers. I don't know how many people have read Sebald here in the room, but there's a lovely um, interview I came across with him, quite an obscure interview recently, in which he talked about um, a moment in his own uh, work as an intellectual and as a writer, in which he became increasingly frustrated with uh, the forms that were available to him as an academic, very frustrated with writing monographs and essays in sort of conventional rhetorical uh, forms. And uh, he said he, he didn't know quite what happened, but that he had suddenly stopped writing and had disappeared into his potting shed. Um, and after a little bit of time kind of scratching around in a potting shed and writing narratives and bits of this and bits of that, People were saying to him, well, you know, what are you doing? He could only say, I don't know, I don't know what's happening in there. Because um, uh, he, he couldn't articulate it. There were bits of memoir, bits of history, um, bits of uh, autobiographical writing. Um, and he was threading it all together into something that he couldn't actually quite describe. Um, but eventually, of course, became this trademark, those extraordinary books, which are, of course, themselves all very different from each other, rings of Saturn, Austerlitz, um, emigrants, and so on. Um, and so, yeah, I would just end by um, making a plea for the potting shed and for experiment and for moving uh, backwards and forwards along the spectrum and not thinking perhaps too hard about the rules that apply at one end or the other. Um, I thought before we open up the, the um, floor to questions, I just wondered whether or not there are any of the other 
speakers here want to catch any of the rabbits that uh, the other speakers let <laughs> out. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, also coming back to say, well, no, also, I actually got a long quote from the other day, I didn't read. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, <laughs> It has a lot to do with what you were saying. Um, it's from Auslitz, uh, actually, which is a sort of a novel. Um, all of us resort to set, set pieces which have been staged often enough by others. We try to reproduce the reality, but the harder we try, the more we find the pictures that make up the stock in trade of the spectacle of history forcing themselves upon us. The fallen drum boy, the infantryman showing the act of stabbing another, a moment frozen still against the turmoil of battle. Our concern with history is, concerned with pre is a concern with preformed images already imprinted on our brains. Images at which we keep staring while the truth lies elsewhere, away from it all, somewhere as yet undiscovered. And I think that's really sort of exactly what you're talking about. But I wanted then to come back a little bit to this, this word authenticity, which people sometimes use as if it's the same as accuracy. And I wonder if we could maybe try to talk about what that word means, because accuracy is, you know, how many groups are there in your crinoline? Authenticity is something quite mm -hmm. different. And there's also a word that, I don't know, for me haunts that word authenticity, which is the word integrity. Yes. Um, which is much more of a personal thing. Um, but, but it's very, very important to me as a writer. I, I, I probably am driven more by the word integrity than I am by authenticity, but they probably amount to almost the same thing. Yes. I think what we've got sort of now shadowing that word authenticity is the whole idea of witness literature and the literature of testimony. And, you know, uh, Elie Wiesel saying in 1977 that, uh, that you can't write a novel about Treblinka. It's either not about Treblinka or not a novel. Or Primo Levi saying in The Drowned in the Say that um, the only people who can really speak about what happened in Auschwitz are the people who can't speak. So that then it becomes forbidden to speak. Um, and then it becomes impossible to have an authentic voice. But I agree with you, I think it's to do with a sort of integrity and honor and honesty in dealing with the material you have as thoroughly as you can. It's a matter of being authentic too, because if you take my point of view on historical fiction, uh, there's a degree of authenticity to the self, to the self of the author. And you are going to write differently at different times in your life and different circumstances, different audiences. So, there is no such thing as simple authenticity or the straightforward integrity. It's always going to be a multi-dimensional mm -hmm. thing as you're uh, authentic to a number of different uh, participants, including yourself. Yeah. And I wonder if, uh, if the, the result of that is that one thinks something is authentic if it corresponds with, coheres with one's previous experience. I mean, it's like these, these uh, <coughs> images that one has of morals or whatever and or, or of anything down to happy it doesn't matter we've got this we've got this these images that are implanted in us from various sources god knows we've got authenticity but they, they then become for us our test for future attempts to represent those periods don't they and as um as Ian says you know the self highly problematic areas. <laughs> you can never avoid it, can you? You can never avoid it. You'll never not be a writer. <laughs> but, but infinitely malleable again, infinitely yeah. reinterpretable, infinitely re-narrative. <laughs> <Absolutely. laughs> I'm going to try to come back on, on something uh, that they said about um, the history of fictiveness. And for me, this is a big, big problem because I felt that the historical establishment wasn't providing a philosophical basis for saying something with confidence or claiming something for certain about the past. And I tried to do this for my own benefit in a, a, an essay, What Isn't History? Uh, and in that I, I resorted to time itself being the centre around which we describe everything in the past. The only centre that is even really related to being time. And therefore, through being able to take primary pieces of evidence uh, and the information contained within them, you could narrow down the possibility of the extent to which you could infinitely uh, re-describe the past. So that those infinities become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, until there's only two or three things you can actually say about the difference between one piece of information and another. And in this respect, when you can define things absolutely as opposed to relatively, you can start to approach saying things with certainty. The problem is they're not normally the things you want to say with certainty. They're normally 
just the goalposts and it's the bit in the middle that's important. Yes, I mean the whole thing of primary seems to me to be problematic. Well, I'm talking about contemporary with somebody knowing something as opposed to rehashing. Exactly. I mean, I, I look at the primary evidence being the end of an information track. So there's an information link between an event and the, the document in which you record information about that event. But if it's at the end of that information, uh, contemporary information trail, I still regard it as a primary and far more trustworthy than somebody reinterpreting it. Um, from another piece of written evidence. The trouble is that so much so-called primary evidence is itself uh, written as an interpretation of what has been experienced by whoever it is. That it's much easier to say if you just concentrate on the medieval side of things, because they're open to sources. That you just look at this very simple uh, information trail from an event to, to the recording of the event. If we could be here for I the two minutes. I was about to say, if we were around a dinner table, this could go on for hours, but alas, I think we perhaps ought to open up the, uh, not alas, I said the wrong thing then. Uh, I think we ought to uh, also open up the floor to, uh, to questions, and Matt here at the front will, uh, will, will give people a mic for them uh, to speak into. So, questions, please. Right, maybe at the front. Hello. Um, I just want to say, we're going to start comments really really opposite to what I'm going to say, I think, but it was really something you were saying um, about you simply comparing a work of fiction with a hoax, which sounded to be very disingenuous. Is that really the same thing? Because obviously a it, fiction begins by saying it is fiction. No, no, with this, I mean, I was actually at that point talking about Benjamin Wilkomersky's memoirs, which were indeed a hoax. Yes, I mean, they were reporting to be um, a, a, Journal, I think, that was about uh, the period of the Holocaust and purporting to give this wonderful sort of first hand evidence of what went on and was accepted as such. I mean, it was, you know, the publishers described it as such and how moved we were all going to be by it. And we probably were until we uh, were told that it was actually all a hoax. I'm not suggesting that, that everybody's trying to misrepresent things, but he certainly did, I have to say. Yeah. I suppose I feel that was a long way along the spectrum. Mm. A long way along the spectrum between historical fact and fiction. Yes, but I think... And quite that, different. Yeah, yes, but you see, as a source of history, it seems to... I think it can, mutatis mutandis, be, be seen possibly to apply. I was thinking of this, I, I mean, I don't know if this makes any sort of sense at all. I, th I mentioned in the relation to slavery, where again, the, the, you know, the, the evidence was, I gather, of destroyed as far as it could be, the witnesses were killed and all the rest of it. But I was then trying to think about it in relation to letters. Well, you could, you could do it actually in relation to the Iraq war, couldn't you? I was actually thinking of it in relation to the banking crisis, where I'm sure a lot of that primary evidence that people are going to find a decade hence will be seriously uh, fake. Lady at the end of the fourth grade. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Obviously not really done. Um, two points. One relates to the Wilkowski um, hoax. Um, there are quite a few first-hand accounts by Polish authors. Sadly, only one of them by um, Tadeusz Borowski has been translated. It's called This Way for the Guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, which are authentic accounts of by people who were in the death camps and who managed to come out. Um, but unfortunately, most of them are, haven't been translated. Um, the other point on hoax is that um, for any historians of witchcraft, um, there have been a lot of hoaxes that have been read as part of the historiography, and um, it was only in the 50s that Ginsburg and others discovered a whole range of resources um, in French that actually had been, um, were actually a hoax, um, which had changed the historiography quite significantly from looking at the witchcraft persecution as beginning with the Cathars and you know, that kind of um, beginning to the persecution, which was substantially earlier than, than it really actually was. Um, and I think there are a lot, of, um, a lot of materials within history that have been proven to be a hoax and that have led the historiography 
down the down the wrong track. So I think to to look at the, the point of hoaxes within history is another fiction, if you like, um, which is something that we all are probably aware of in our different fields. Yes, when thank you. Sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah, just say it, it, it does uh, accentuate the, the need to be really sceptical, doesn't it, about one's primary sources. Mm -hmm. And then the gentleman at the front. John Mullen in sorry <laughs> John Mullen in how novels work uh, talks about how he feels that as historical novels he says pile up the references the author's notes the bibliographies in fact he says he feels that that makes the historical novel admit to being lesser that in trying to compete with history with history writing I should say it's actually admitting to a lesser status because it cannot do it as well as history can. And it does seem to me, I would be interested to know how, how much you all agree with that. It's very particular, it's mine. Um, but it also seems to me that one way to do this barrier that we, we need to maintain a distinction, I, I agree, between what's fiction and what's history, even when we are working on in that area. Um, one way of dealing with it is to make the novel be as novelly as possible, is, is to deal with its fictionalness. I mean, in, in one of my novels, it explores the restoration of a house as trying to make a kind of historical fiction, you know, how, how the National Trust sets about making a house look real when they don't know what the door houses look like, say. Or then missing a bit, do you do reproduction? Do you do clean glass and steel and stop trying to pretend. And I think in some ways historical fiction can work with clean glass and steel and think, yeah, this is a novel. But I would be interested to know what you think of bibliographies, bibliography, bibliographies and so on. Are they trying to make historical fiction be what it was never meant to be? Um, well, one of the things that surprised me after starting to publish historical fiction, as I'm sure happened to you as well, is that people write and said, what more can I mean about this? You know, um, in Ghost Talk, I, I dealt with, rather, rather ambitiously, with uh, entanglement theory, which is part of quantum theory. And uh, there were a number of people who wrote specifically about that and said, uh, this is really interesting, I want to know more, where do I start? Um, and so, you know, I, I think there was a case to be made for putting bibliographies in, not to tell people how much you read in order to put your material together because there's no end to that but it, but perhaps further reading uh, it will take people into special you know, specialist areas of interest um, but but yeah I, I and i also will always put authors note because i do think it again from readers from talking to readers and i've learned a lot from that experience they they do want to know what uh, or a lot a large number do want to know where the edges are, and I think Mr. Shortman explaining who the made-up characters are and who the real ones are, and so on, is, is worth doing. It's but that, you want to come in? Yeah, can I come yes. in? Yes. Um, that can also uh, end up damaging the work of the, the fiction side yes, of the world. That's my um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I know this from experience because of my last book, I put it, the first line the author's note is a complete work of fiction, nothing relates to the past at all. And, and it's sold really bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I reckon that you can significantly damage that um, enjoyment or, or suspension of disbelief by puncturing a put, put person in the balloon. But I, I think the, 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 the second line history aspect and there's a couple of the Italian critics now, in 1860, who pointed out that historical fiction is trying to do, it's it fundamentally flawed, but it's trying to do something new and something old at the same time. And you can't have it both ways. Um, I can't remember who, who else wrote that. And there, I think there is something in that, that, that if you are trying to represent the past as opposed to eternal truths, um, you are going to write second night history. You can't use fiction to represent the past wholly. It's not about the past, it's about the, the links, uh, uh, and as you say, the, the, the proofs can't be, uh, the, the, the facts can't be proven. Or, uh, <laughs> so, so I think there is an element, or you're, you're running the risk of a second main history, but I think you can damage the fiction as well. I, I agree, I think it's like taking the spin off the cricket ball, you know, it's like, I, I always feel slightly annoyed by reading all those lists of, of books at the back, because I think, well, I don't need this. If I want to know that stuff, I'll, I'll, I'll read a, a history book. And, and the, the, the contrast, again, is Sebald, who, you know, you have absolutely no idea when you're reading The Emigrants 
are they fake photographs? Are they real photographs? Uh, you know, what is what is the truth status of this text? Um, and I'm I'm, all, I'm happy with that. Um, Oscar and Lucinda was ruined for me because the author's notice at the beginning acknowledged an expert on on um, Philip Goss as having been as and Plymouth Brethren and all that. And I then was reading the whole of the first bit, matching it to what I knew about mm. Philip Goss instead of reading it as a novel, which was where I started agreeing with Mother. <laughs> Gentlemen. Oh, sorry, Cora. Yes, Cora. Yes, you come in. Yes. You know, I, I, I don't agree with that. I love the footnotes and the endnotes, and that doesn't ruin the, the reading for me at all. And, I mean, the French lieutenant's woman who sold really well. <laughs> and, you know, it's sort of made up because that's what made it an original and interesting book. Um, you know, some novels weave that inside, like possession. You can keep, you know, any, any readerly person can tell, uh, you know, what's being. You know, what, you know, what's being referred to and you know, who the real writers are and so forth. But I, I don't, I mean, I think it, I think it entirely depends on, on the writing. I can't, I can't see why a set of sources could possibly destroy the, the readerliness of the book. Not that I don't think what Seagull does is great, but I, I, that's, I find that really a really puzzling thing. I mean, there's complementarity, there's competition. You, I think readers know that a, a historical novel of a particular kind is in sort of, uh, you know, is in relation to the history. So Maybe it depends whether way. you read them, listen, read the, whether the author's notes at the beginning or the end. Mm -hmm. well, there's, there's also, I guess, there's also just the sense of, of doing justice to the people whose work you've used. Which is yeah, there's a scholarly. <coughs> well, not just scholarly, but for example, in what I'm writing, I've used an awful lot of memoirs. For the and I, I would acknowledge those because I'm taking other people's work. So I I'm just contradicting what I said. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's a case of putting it on the website rather than in the book, as it were. Yeah. So that people don't have to engage with the paper. Mm -hmm. I think maybe just one, one point, and then there's this gentleman at the front here who's got a question. Yes, I was just reminded, or I just reminded myself, that um, Hilary Mantel last night spoke about feeling a need sometimes to footnote every sentence she wrote. And it, I wonder if this doesn't open up um, the question of whether maybe we get too hung up on definitions. I mean, history itself is, is a his, historicizable concept, isn't it? And maybe it, it needs to be, well, no, I go further than that, I'd say it has been over the last decades very much amplified in large. So history now incorporates, I believe, much more than it used to in the, in the matter of expressing feelings and emotions and all these other things that have previously been the preserve of, of historical fiction. So maybe maybe we're getting too hung up on definitions. Okay. Gentlemen at the front, uh, well, I'm afraid we'll have to be the rather skin and stay in what this point out. <laughs> uh, I, just to, to put to the panel, uh, this idea of integrity, one's personal integrity, and then of course integrity before an audience. Um, the way it is that my I'm a lapsed Methodist at best. I think a Methodist who ceased to meet is the technical term. Uh, but my last novel has ended up being put forward in the beatification process for the first South African saint in Rome. When they wrote to me, I did point out he was the villain of the book, and this didn't seem to throw him in the <laughs> <laughs> Auden's comment about being judged by a foreign code of conscience yes, comes to mind. My, my, it's a proposal which I would like the panel to respond to. When I write historical fiction, I think the difference for me between, as a novelist to a historian, is I don't... When I start out doing research for a kind of feeling of mastery of the period, place, etc., 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 but that's never my aim. What, what's happened over the, the sort of church aside, humble to two novels I've written, is that it ends up at a point where the material, it's not a matter of mastery, but resistance. I research as hard as I can, I do it as best I can so that I reach the point where the material is actually judging me and not me judging the material, where, where in a way I have to give up and then I try and seize that moment to write from and somehow I find in that something that I, I feel I can speak to and that there's a vague hope that somebody <coughs> it will connect in some way with an audience. But the, the, the proposal is just this, you know, where, where's the line between research as mastery and research as resistance? a resistance that, that in a way prompts 
what I feel is where the historical novel really takes off. Do you mean resistance as in revisionism, as in resisting the, the material that you start with? I'm, I'm not quite sure that I, I understand what you mean by resistance. Because I also experience resistance, but I'm not sure whether it's the same thing that you're talking about. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, very weird putting my, my words are haunting me already as, as being horribly bad. But I think that the other, the old word, fundamentally any act of fiction is an act of entering otherness. I mean, that's what distinguishes mm -hmm. it, you know, to just be absolutely that, yeah. fundamental and banal. But uh, I, I choose to make history the form of otherness that I want to enter. But it then must be a true otherness, not something I can masquerade and then ventriloquize through. Mm -hmm. It must be an, a point at just, which I, I, I just feel those things take, take over. And that's where I, you know, the resistance makes me surrender and something else altogether starts happening. Mm -hmm. That's where the like alchemy of fiction takes place. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. No, I, uh, I uh, yeah, yeah, I'll just be very brief because I'm sure you've got one well, you know, to answer this. But um, yeah, the, the, that business of mastery and resistance and to be um, thrown off something, you know, you, uh, I guess for, for me one of the really big differences between writing the kinds of books I wrote uh, over the 20 years in which I was you know, a fairly straightforward academic is that I did have mastery over the material and that now that I enter this world, which I say, you know, unsettles me in all sorts of bizarre ways, um, I have had to give up mastery and, you know, I, I will come to a project I spent much of this summer trying to begin a novel on the 19th century, on the 10th and the 19th century, and it threw me off. It would not have me anywhere near it. I wasn't interested in it and so on. Um, but, I, but something else has emerged, which is 16th century London, which I'm completely fascinated by. Um, and that's one of the things I suppose I've had to learn in this new world is, um, is a degree of humility and of letting the projects come up out of the deep in a way that um, uh, I certainly wouldn't have done with academic work. Um, uh, sense of otherness. I'm, I think you're making that sense of otherness, or you're convincing us it's got this otherness through the process of research. And personally, I actually think there is such a thing as historical fiction, because it's all fiction. Every piece of fiction is to some degree or other historical. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you're, you're creating this otherness by researching it, you're creating the world you, you wouldn't be don't know about as it were. Um, so I, I don't think there is such a distinction. I think you're creating through the process. I mean, I don't do any research in my novels because uh, if I look something up, if I I'll look up in Cheney, if I need to know the date, exact date, or use the NASA website to work out the full moon or not. But in terms of research, it, it, it's not about that otherness, it's about that conveyance, messaging, I suppose, imparting the, 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 or, or suggesting the truths. But I think the most interesting, so I don't think it's a, a, a matter of otherness, and I don't think it's a matter of resistance. Well, I'd love to, I mean, we could go on, I think, rounds, but I, I reluctantly have to bring this to a close. I just want to, if you could just thank all of our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.